Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be starting in a short moment. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Vamos a empezar en un momento. I want to let everyone know that there is a Spanish interpreter. Um, his name is Carlos Diaz de Leon, and um, you can hear this webinar in Spanish. Quiero que todos sepan que hay un intérprete para español, entonces pueden oír este seminario en español. Um, su nombre del intérprete es Carlos Diaz de Leon. To turn on uh, Spanish interpretation on your computer, um, in your uh, beating webinar controls at the bottom of your screen, you will see click interpretation. And to listen in English or original audio, which is in English, just click English. And to click in Spanish, uh, or to listen in Spanish, click the Spanish option. Um, you can mute the original audio if you would like to hear that in Spanish. Um, while the original audio is being interpreted. Um, if you need captions, you can click the more button, which is located also at the bottom of your uh, screen at the bottom bar and you select captions. En los controles de la reunión, en la barra inferior hay una, este, puede hacer clic en la interpretación. Seleccione español para oír en español. Eh, haga clic en el eh, mute original audio si desea escuchar el fondo de, 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 del audio original en inglés. Si necesita subtítulos, haga clic en el botón more y seleccione subtítulos. Para oírlo en su teléfono, um, en los controles de la reunión, haga clic en more y seleccione language interpretation y ahí puede seleccionar español. Si necesita subtítulos, también puede hacer clic el botón más y seleccione subtítulos. To listen in Spanish on your phone, uh, you will have the same controls in, uh, in the in uh, in your meeting controls. Just tap more, and then you can select language interpretation, and you can listen in English or Spanish. And there's also captions uh, in, with the if you click the button. Um, more, uh, which is the three dots, you um, select captions there as well. If you have a question, um, please enter any questions for our panelists or hosts in the Q&A section, which is also at the bottom uh, in your user dashboard. Uh, the webinar is recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. The webinar facilitators are um, Anna Zivertz from uh, Disability Mobility Initiative and also Mike McGinn, the Executive Director of America Walks. We wanna thank our sponsors. Um, we're grateful to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and our uh, other partners. And also we just wanna say thank you to all of our supporters, uh, your um, generous support, uh, whether you're a regular attendee at our webinars or you made a donation, you are what help our programs continue to thrive. So thank you. And to all our first time webinar attendees, welcome. These programs allow us to directly support local grassroots activism and education and make an impact on issues all the way up to the federal level. So if you like this content, please consider making a donation. Again, just very quickly, I will say the interpretation in Spanish. En los controles de la reunión en la barra inferior, puede uh, clic en la interpretación para oír este seminario en español. Haga clic en mute, mute original audio si desea escuchar de fondo el audio original en inglés. Si necesita subtítulos, haga clic en el botón botón más y selecciono subtítulos. En el, también puede oírlo en su teléfono. También tiene controles de la reunión. Haga clic en más. Puede seleccionar language interpretation. Seleccione mute original audio para no escuchar de fondo el idioma original. 
Y si necesita subtítulos, haga clic en el botón más y seleccione subtítulos. I will hand this over now to Anna to uh, present our webinar speakers. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, again, I'm Anna Zivartz. I direct the Disability Mobility Initiative at Disability Rights Washington in Washington State. And I'm thrilled to be joined by a panel of experts uh, and advocates and elected leaders today. Our, our first advocate is Tanil Warren, uh, who's a non-driver advocate from Metro Transit Minneapolis. We also have with us Adrian Rizavi from the Denver Streets Partnership, and they're one of the host organizations for a week without driving. Uh, and then we have council member Lindsay Schroeman Warren, who's a council member from Port Angeles, Washington, and who has participated in the week without driving uh, the last couple of years. And then finally joining us in a few minutes uh, is Senator Marco Elias, who is uh, a Senator from Washington state and also the chair of the Washington state Senate transportation committee. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to begin with a couple of questions um, for our, our, our guest panelists today. And the first one is just for you to get to know them a little better, for each of them to introduce themselves and to talk about one place uh, that you normally go to that's easy for you to get to and one place that's particularly hard. And I asked this question today because it's a question that we started out asking folks uh, as part of our story map and organizing work here at Disability Rights Washington, as we wanted to get the, to know the needs of non-drivers um, in our community and where, uh, where they can access, where they can't, and what could change to make their communities uh, easier for them to get around. So uh, let's go in that original order, uh, Tanil, uh, then Adrian, uh, then, then Lindsay. Talk to us, um, quick introduction, who you are, where you live, one place that's easy for you to get to in your community and one place that's hard and why. Thank Tenille. you. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm Tanil Warren. I'm a commuter program specialist in um, Minneapolis, St. Paul area, Minnesota. Um, Normally, I am a public transit rider, walker, car share, those kinds of things. Um, the easiest place for me to get currently is to work. Um, and the hardest place for me to get is um, somewhere necessary. And that's like doctor's appointments. That's that's hard. So um, thank you for having me today. Awesome. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Adrian Rizavi. I'm the organizing manager for the Denver Streets Partnership here in Denver, Colorado. Um, normally I get around by e-bike. Um, I also take the bus or the light rail sometimes, sometimes with my bike. Um, and then I do have a car that I take for some trips, but try to avoid driving as much as possible. Um, for me, it's pretty easy to get work to work downtown on any of those modes. It's actually hardest by car because it's just as stressful, but um, there's a lot of transit options on a direct east-west line, um, so it's pretty easy to do that. I just it takes a lot of time, um, and then it's really hard for me to get into places that are just southwest of Denver, so like on the map, um, because it, there's a lack a lack of transit options that are kind of diagonally across town, uh, and then if you miss transfers, that can leave you wasting a lot of time. Thank you, and Councilmember uh, Sherman Warren. Hi, everybody. Lindsay Sherman Warren. I, um, so Port Angeles is a rural community of about just over 20,000 people on the Olympic Peninsula of Western Washington. Um, it's, it's rural Western Washington. Um, so our bus service historically has really, uh, been like a lifeline service and you end up having to schedule your day around the bus. Like before you make an appointment in another town, you would need to check the bus schedule to make sure you could actually make that appointment time, that sort of thing. So um, for folks who don't have the ability to drive, it's um, it's very difficult, I think, depending on where you are and where you live. My spouse and I have decided we want the, the flexibility of being able to access, um, access things by walking. So we very intentionally and we're lucky and privileged to be able to live near the center of town I could walk to two grocery stores within three blocks, which is um, pretty amazing in a small, a small rural area. Um, but you know, without a car, it's very hard to access anything that's not near the bus line. Uh, it's often multiple, um, you know, multiple trips or bike, bus combos or 
um, three different rural bus lines with three different rural bus companies and hoping that they're on time enough that the next bus will hold. So you make the connection and don't have a three hour layover or bring your sleeping bag because that's the next option. That is so true. Thank you. Yes, for so much of our country um, outside of our big cities and, you know, that have more frequent transit, it really is uh, can be an all day event trying to get somewhere on the bus. Uh, so I want to talk to you quickly about the the sort of the history uh, for those of you in the audience who don't know the week without driving, how it started here in Washington state and now uh, how it's gone uh, to become the national week without driving. Thanks to support from America Walks and tremendous organizing work by Ruth, who uh, introduced us. Uh, today. Um, so the week without driving, we kicked it off here in Washington State back in 2021. And it came out of our desire as we started to speak to non-drivers about our mobility needs. Uh, we wanted elected leaders and those in uh, decision making positions, policy makers, transit agency heads, uh, transportation professionals, to really understand some of the barriers that non-drivers experience in our communities and uh, the inspiration for the week without driving came from my previous work. I, I worked for many years in the labor movement and had seen how um, many, many service worker unions do uh, activities with elected officials, whether ask elected officials to come spend the day and shadow one of the service workers uh, who's fighting for better wages or fighting for health care. And so I thought, wow, wouldn't that be cool if we could try something like that here? Um, there was one particular example where uh, uh, it was a we were shadowing um, now Mayor Muriel Bowser in D.C. And I think having her ride the bus and then the metro and pay fare twice in D.C. really helped her understand some of the barriers folks in her communities were experiencing. And so that was the inspiration for Week Without Driving and how it how it started. And um, this year, I think we've had more than 100 uh, groups from 35 different states become host organizations. And so uh, Adrian uh, and Denver Streets Partnership is one of those groups. And I'd love to hear from you, Adrian, a little bit about why uh, you all, what you thought when you heard about the Week Without Driving Challenge and why it's useful and how it may, um, how, how it's been useful and what, what you're hoping for the future as far as your organization uh, being a host and uh, hosting the Week Without Driving this year. Yeah, well, um, so we have a unique opportunity here just that Denver is um, kind of, the tide is turning a little bit um, for us. Um, so when we as an organization heard about the Week Without Driving, we have some partner organizations and grassroots groups that we work with and thought this would be a great way to collaborate. Um, so we brought it here, but um, we're an interesting spot because Denver is really car centric. So we're going against the grain in advocating here, but almost contradictorily, almost a third of Denverites don't drive. So there's definitely a need for a more equitable system. And there's a taste for it from some people who drive as well, um, especially considering Denver's first in the nation e-bike rebate program and the one that recently opened statewide. There are now more exciting ways to get around without driving. So we're hoping that this challenge sparks some long-term habit changes in replacing some car trips. Um, so our goal is kind of twofold for this initiative to get community members trying to replace driving trips to gain that personal experience to get conversations going and to spur advocacy but then we also want to get our local elected and city officials to gain this experience to center people who don't drive in their decision making for systemic changes so that every year we do this week without driving it'll be easier to take part Exactly. Yeah, it's definitely something we've seen gain momentum here in Washington State over the last couple of years. And, um, you know, this year it finally has sort of launched on its own. And even without us as an organization asking elected leaders or community groups to to do the outreach, we've seen how um, we've gotten a lot of proclamations and a lot of participation. Tanil, I wanted to ask you about your experience as a non-driver and why you think it might be uh, useful for those who normally do drive places and have that easy access to experience um, and have a better understanding of some of the barriers in, in accessing your community without driving. Right. I think it's useful um, to be able to step out of your comfort zone and see what other people are experiencing. Um, it's easy for us to say, you know, I drive everywhere or someone to to not know what the barriers are for someone. Then I, I feel like try that. Stop, don't drive, walk, see how people get around, see, 
see the bus system, see see how hard or easy it is for people out in our um, suburbs to get to the city to work or to get to the grocery store. You know, trying something different to see it from somebody else's eyes is is it's just it's a good way to to do lots of things, um, especially if you're a decision maker. Um, you want to talk to the ones that those decisions are going to affect. So I think this is a good thing. I want people to try it. I want I want more people to take part in it so they can see what, you know, if you're not aware of something, you can't really change things. But if you do it, then you know what the barriers are and, and you can help change. Is there a particular barrier uh, that you wish or, or experience that you wish uh, an elected official would have that's something that you, you encounter in your uh, life? You know, for me, it's, um, you know, I work for a transit agency and most people are, are, are willing to listen, but it's the, it, you know, especially for me, it's the doctor appointment. Those are necessary. I have to get to those and I can't. I don't have the ability if I if I'm not paying for, you know, a car share or if I'm not walking miles and miles and being exhausted by the time I get there or, um, you know, bugging my family and friends to take me. Um, so now, currently, I am having the personal struggle of switching doctors that I've had for years that know my situation, that know everything so that I can be closer to transit to get there easier when I, I have to go see them. Um, so I just, I think if people really understood that, you know, people that take transit all the time, me, that's that's what I rely on, that I can't use it for everything. Um, and especially the things I need. I need my doctors. I need to be able to see them. Um, yeah, we can do virtual visits, but then I physically need to be there for other things, tests and all of that. Um, just just so people really, you know, I, I just want people to understand that it's not something that I'm choosing not to do. I just, that, that is a necessity. The doctor is a necessity. And I wish more people would realize that. Yeah, no, there is. And, and it, I think for those of us who can't drive, like, you know, your world starts to shrink when you start to eliminate things and things. And then there's things you really can't eliminate, right? Like going to the doctor or the ER or, you know, a pharmacy, like these things uh, are part of life. And we should be able to build communities that that can work for those in, in our, you know, have our access needs met. Um, Lindsay, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your experience with Week Without Driving last year. And I um, remember we after the Week Without Driving, uh, my colleagues and I did a bunch of video interviews with elected officials who participated. And your video stood out to me because you were talking a lot about, uh, you know, what happens when folks age out of driving and how communities like Port Angeles and other parts of, of the country where there's a lot of seniors moving because they're lower cost often are more rural and they don't have that that transit reliability. Do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, your your reflections on the week without driving, your experience and that connections to your work around livability and livability for for seniors? Yeah, happily. I and I apologize my mic settings were off. Is it easier to hear me now? That is so much better. Wonderful. Okay. Sorry about that. No worry. Um, yeah, so um, week without driving, right? So I'm asked as an elected official and I'm like, well, I really shouldn't look at my calendar first because that wouldn't be fair. So I just say yes. And then I look at my calendar and um, my spouse is a wildlife guide. She takes people on um, day hikes in the park and occasionally I'll support her like to drive if they're doing a through hike where you know it's transportation for one, one spot or another. And sure enough, she had asked me to drive for her on one of the days a week without driving. And now I was stuck. I'm like, oh no, like I'm gonna have to ask somebody I love and care about and I'm here to support, hey, uh, I can't do this for you. I have to inconvenience you. And that was really helpful for me because that's what a lot of people have to deal with every every day of like, hey, can I ask for this favor? Um, can I, you know, yeah. And so I, I was, I was, I was not sure what to do. And then fortunately my spouse's tour plans changed and I, I didn't have to deal with that, um, that conundrum, but that was, that was like 
my my um, my struggle with week without driving. Um, and as as I said before, living in a walkable place means it's really easy to not drive. Um, so there's such a connection between our land use patterns and our transportation patterns, and the way that we develop uh, cities or or rural places, and the way that we expect transit to work in those places. So um, Port Angeles. I've heard stories from people who use wheelchairs of getting let off the bus and being on a sidewalk where there's no curb cuts. So they're stuck. They're like on an island. You know what I mean? Like you can't cross the street because there's no curb cuts. And it's like, okay, great. Like that's really helpful that the bus, you know, is able to take somebody in a wheelchair and, and leave them stuck then. And then the next bus is half an hour or even an hour away. Right. So there's all of these inadequacies in our transportation system that, um, people age into not being able to drive. Most of us will become disabled before we pass away. So like, this should be something we expect. My mom had a brainstem stroke in 2014. The next morning, her life was completely changed and she's never driven again. Actually, she tried to drive and that was a huge mistake and she shouldn't have done that. Um, but like, that's how much people want to have what we perceive as that freedom of driving. And we know kids aren't driving. Um, I think it's something like a third of the population doesn't drive. So why are we designing these urban spaces that categorically exclude so many people from being able to have mobility and access? And, and you know, what we think of, if we think of the car in, in US culture, that access to freedom, freedom to move around should be available to everybody regardless, regardless of whether you drive. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that that idea of that burden of asking for favors, I think, is something that we hear a lot in reflections from elected leaders and from, you know, non-drivers in, in our daily lives. You know, it, it may be OK to ask once, but then when you start to do it all the time or you do it because it's, uh, you know, it, it seems like an optional thing, like a social activity, you choose not to ask. And, and that does um, really contribute to isolation. I want to ask. Um, Adrian, a little bit more about your work in uh, in 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 Denver, and in particular, all the tremendous work that's happening around sidewalk access, and how you think Week Without Driving might um, support that, or what your hopes are for Week Without Driving in the future. Yeah, well, um, Denver was we were excited to have a ballot measure passed last year that um, totally revamps how sidewalks are built and maintained uh, in the city. And so it's going from um, essentially private property's responsibility to um, the city's responsibility through a fee. Um, and it hasn't been implemented yet, but we are um, working with the city to get that happening. And so um, within the next 10 years, hopefully Denver will be an entirely walkable city in that there will be ADA like width accessible sidewalks everywhere, which is pretty exciting. Um, but in the meantime, definitely having some um, conversations and difficulties around um, just transportation and land use and housing, um, thinking about like, we have a housing crisis here um, and it's compounded by our poor land use. And so because housing and transportation are so uh, expensive for Denverites, there's a lot of people who are looking for alternatives, plus we have just really lovely weather. And so um, you can get outside and, and be outside of your car um, pleasantly most of the year. Um, so we are seeing just a lot of interest in, in alternative ways to do that. And we're hoping that National Week Without Driving that we'll be able to, to get these participants who, even if they only go a few days without driving, even if they change only some of their trips, uh, will be able to use their experience to help us advocate uh, as Denver continues to see the changes in the built environment that are coming as a result of really rethinking um, what our land use looks like. Yeah, thank you for for bringing that to land use and housing because I think that is such just an important thing here, and it's it's really not just about you know oh we need more transit or we need that sidewalk fixed, right? We really need to think about how can we make it possible to get to places without having to to be driven, right? And rely on others or, um, you know, how, how can we have housing that's affordable uh, close to the places we need to go? Tanil or Lindsay, do you wanna uh, share anything else around your thoughts on how this makes you think about land use and housing and um, zoning um, 
before I move on. <laughs> I we we could sidetrack the entire conversation yes. into that. I mean, I think it's so key for us to understand that transportation and land use are inter intricately interconnected. And what we see in rural areas, uh, and this is changing, but it used to be like, oh, it doesn't matter where we locate this service or where we locate um, high density housing, apartment buildings, because we'll just run the bus out there. And then we end up with these you know, underfunded rural bus routes that are incredibly inefficient. I like to call them Pac-Man routes because they kind of like go around like Pac-Man and you could almost walk if you're able to walk faster than the bus would be because it's so circuitous um but so so that's incredibly inefficient and it creates a bad transportation system then it gives the bus a bad name because it's not efficient and then like people are like well why do we even have the bus and so it starts with land use like port angeles years ago decided to put the night by night shelter way on the outskirts of town probably because people didn't want a night by night shelter in the first place right and instead of having it like near the hospital, which would make a lot more sense. And um, now like there's just really inefficient land use and we're wrestling with all of these consequences of those bad decisions in the past. So if we start with, with land use and thinking about your know, density as destiny for cities and even small towns, um, I think we can end up with much better transportation systems, certainly more walkability, and then have efficient public transit that can work in connection with that. And thinking too about transit riders are also pedestrians almost all the time. So it doesn't start and stop at the bus that we have to have the sidewalks or the safe streets, complete streets, if, if we wanna use that term, uh, connected to a transportation system that really works and really gets people where we need to go. Uh, we've been also doing some things with micro mobility, um, Bird Scooters is now able to operate in small towns like Port Angeles through kind of a, I'm not sure if it's a kind of um, outsourcing gig model, but um, so we have Bird Scooters in Port Angeles. The Clallam Transit Network has, or system has done um, micro mobility um, vehicles in some of the other small towns, basically. So it's like door to door by public transit, you know, rather than Uber, but that level of efficiency. Um, so, you know, really saying those Pac-Man routes don't make sense anymore. Let's use modern transportation options, you know, with network technology in order to get people actually where they're trying to go at a faster speed than you know, playing Pac-Man, right? Thank you. Daniel, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you wanted to respond to the land use question, but I also wanted to ask you a little bit about why it's important in your in your experience for the expertise of people who rely on systems who are non-drivers uh to be at the table and to have you know their voices uh, heard and be part of this conversation and i'm i'm excited that you work for a transit agency i think we need more more people who ride transit running transit um so yeah if you want to respond to that or to the land use question yeah, I agree. I think um, more people who work for transit should ride transit um, just just so they know. They know the ins and outs of how things things are going. Um, one thing I can say about that is we have a general manager that rides it regularly and she has an open door policy. So I, I can come and talk to her about the routes and how things are working. And I think that's amazing. Um, you know, I think it's important for non-drivers to be at that table because we see it a lot differently, um, especially for me. I live in a suburb of one of our major cities. So I live in a suburb of St. Paul. And for me, if I miss that bus, it's going to be another hour for the other bus to come. Or I can walk to the next city, which is maybe about 12 blocks, but it doesn't have sidewalk all the way. So I'm walking in the street, those 12 blocks, and then there's some sidewalk that I can get on to then wait in the street for a bus to get me to where I need to be. Um, those things aren't well known unless you actually have to do it and I've had to do it. So inviting me to those, you know, me and people like me to the table to be able to say, you know, yeah, it's a great idea that you give us a bus, but if I miss that first one, 
I have to wait an hour. Then I'm really late for wherever I was trying to get to. Um, and maybe, maybe I was trying to go to, to pick up a prescription and they're, they're going to close and I can't get that prescription and I need it, but bringing me to the table to be able to say that, to open those eyes, to say, thank you for giving us a bus route that comes past us. But what if we think of it another way, um, you know, and, and to just bring the safety issue in there. I, I walk on, um, a very busy road with no sidewalk to get to the next city next to me in order to get on a bus if I've missed mine. It's dangerous. I watch myself. I have to, I watch, I watch myself. I watch the drivers. I'm, I'm cautious. I'm anxious. I'm nervous. I'm all of that before I can even get to a semi safe spot. Um, I just think it's important that our voice is heard. Exactly. It's something that I think, yeah, I think maybe one of the, the the pieces of this challenge, right, is that we want elected leaders and those decision makers who don't normally get around not driving to understand how much they don't know, right, about the systems um, that they, they manage and so that they can turn to the expertise of non-drivers when they recognize that there's those gaps in knowledge. And, um, you know, those missing sidewalk pieces, I think, are really key and often a surprise to people uh, who have normally been able to get in a car and, and skip that part. I know we had uh, a legislator who participated two years ago who talked a lot about this missing sidewalk she encountered on 95th Street in Seattle trying to get to a youth service center. And uh, and we've been, been able to, you know, through a lot of advocacy from her and other folks, um, get that missing sidewalk, the funding for that secured, not constructed yet, but you know, it does lead to change. And so that piece is exciting. Uh, thank you, Senator Leas, for joining us. I really appreciate you making time in your busy schedule. So I'm going to go ahead and have you introduce yourself. Yeah, just so everyone knows who you are, uh, where you live, and uh, what your experience of Week Without Driving has been so far. Hi, everyone. I'm Marco Leas. I'm a state senator in Washington state. I also get to chair our Senate Transportation Committee. So I get to work with Anna all the time and am so delighted uh, to see her bringing our uh, Washington innovation to the national stage, a uh, week without driving. I live in a suburban Seattle metro area in South Snohomish County, and we just moved over the summer, my partner and I, and um, you know, at the time, I sort of had a sense that we were not going to be as connected to our active transportation. And Week Without Driving is always a good excuse to, like, actually sort through the details. And I discovered that I am a 30-minute walk from my nearest bus station, bus stop here. And the nearest bus stop is not an express bus stop. It's, like, 30 minutes to, like, a very low frequency bus service. Um, we also have not yet implemented our e-bike incentives. We've passed them, but they're not on the ground yet. So that's my eventual dream is to get an e-bike because it's uphill, like seriously uphill to that bus stop. So, um, you know, for me, it's been a lot about, you know, thinking through how would I uh, get to that bus stop if I needed mobility assistance or couldn't walk up a long hill and it's a $20 Uber ride uh, for me to get up there or what I've resorted to this week, which is carpooling. So um, asking folks to, to come get me. Today, I get to work from home, uh, which is <laughs> a, a much uh, less stressful way of uh, working without driving. But um, yeah, it's been, it's always a good eye opener to like think about not just how do we do mobility for the whole state, but like how do we do mobility for me and my life and think through the, steps of what I would need to take um, if I was going to do this on a regular basis. For sure. Yeah. And those those hills, those hills are real. It definitely motivated me to get e-mobility in my life um, out here in Seattle. It makes a big difference when it's less of a, oh my gosh, can I really make it up that hill uh, choice? So um, I wanted to ask Adrian if you've had uh, seen so far this year any elected officials from the uh, Denver area who participated or are thinking about it or our policymakers, um, other leaders, any of their thoughts or reactions or responses uh, to the challenge and, and where you think that might lead? 
Um, we haven't heard from them directly, but we have gotten a few folks um, who are elected officials to participate. Um, so we have a couple of staff members from the Depart Denver Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. We have uh, a, a official from the Colorado Department of Transportation. We have one city council member, um, a mayor, not our, not Denver's mayor, but an out <clears throat> outlying area's mayor, and then. Um, some other smattering of folks as well. So got a good variety. Um, haven't heard from them directly how it's been so far, but looking forward to um, to hearing from them. We're, we have a film screening of the street projects actually um, on Saturday and a panel discussion following that. And um, a couple of them will be involved in that, uh, including two of our um, transit agencies board directors who are participating in the challenge. So um, looking forward to hearing what they have to say about this experience, um, hoping it's going to be eye opening, even if they aren't able to participate for the whole week. Um, but really hoping just to see that making considerations for people who aren't driving in the course of their day to day decision making is really the goal for us here to help them um, have memorable experience, personal experiences that they can then center when they make their decisions back in their offices during their meetings um, in that intellectual space. So, um, you know, hopefully this small group of the folks we've gotten this year, we'll, we will be able to expand that um, to next year and, and just kind of keep um, impressing upon them the importance of that lived experience in making policy decisions. That's so exciting that you're doing events. It's something I'm aspiring to do more of in the future uh, as we build capacity with Week Without Driving. And that it is interesting too. I think here in Washington state, we've had a lot of um, response from folks who are you know, from more rural areas. And that is surprising to me because we know it is you know, generally much harder. And, um, but you know, it is that it's usually someone who knows someone in their personal life, an elected official who has a family member or a close friend or a relative who can't drive. And they know that, that yes, there are even in small towns and rural areas, lots of non-drivers and we can't just think about non-drivers in big cities um, that we need to think about those, those access needs everywhere and uh, figure out, you know, ways to make, make connections and make sure people don't get isolated and, uh, and stuck at home. I um, wanted to ask uh, Senator Leah, since you joined us, you get another one. <laughs> um, and then we'll probably turn it over to Q&A in just a few minutes. So start thinking of your questions and submit those. But Senator Leah, I wanted to ask you um, what it's been like and, and uh, to have, you know, since we've been doing this organizing here in Washington State, elevating the voices of non-drivers, emphasizing the importance of of connections for those of us who can't and don't drive can't afford to drive how that's helped shape some of the transportation work at the at the state level um, and what you what your hopes are uh, for uh, for policies making it easier for people to get around without driving moving forward yeah I, I mean I would say the biggest impact has been really mainstreaming this conversation that's already always been there you know I have known since I first got involved in transportation policy that, you know, roughly one in three of the folks in our state don't uh, drive as a part of their daily commute. But that wasn't a mainstream view. Like my colleagues on the transportation committees, my colleagues in the legislature, I don't think have all gone through the thought exercise of, you know, who doesn't drive and why. And so I think Week Without Driving has been a great way to just draw attention to it in a positive way, right? Like to put ourselves in the in the shoes and the wheels of people who move differently. And then we've built off of it. And on, I'm, I know I joined late, so you've probably heralded some of our great work here in Washington, but we did a study uh, of who are our, uh, and I hate calling them non-drivers because I feel like, you know, A, all of us are non-drivers. Like it is impossible to drive, you know, from your bed to your bathroom in your house. So like, we are all on some level non-drivers every day in various ways. So I hate to define us by like what we don't do, um, but you know, walkers and rollers are really critical um, uh, parts of our transportation system. That's how uh, all of us move at some point and a lot of us move um, all the time. And so our study talked about some of the disaggregating, some of the different impacts. It is true that if you are a walker or a roller in a rural area, there's much different challenges and constraints. But as I talk to some of our 
rural and remote tribes, we've got a lot of indigenous folks who that is uh, their primary way of moving around. And from an equity and social justice lens, we need to think about, you know, for the Soxwaddle tribe to get to their uh, community health center or their community education center, they have to walk on very narrow roads in rural Skagit and Snohomish County. And, you know, we need to think about that from that lens. We also, uh, which I really love this year, are uh, working with the University of Washington and on your organization and others to do community mapping of infrastructure because we don't really have a comprehensive sense of where our sidewalk and uh, other infrastructure is. And if we do, we don't really have a good sense of its condition. So there may be a map somewhere that says there is a sidewalk on the street, but does it have roots in it? Does it have cracks in it? You know, are there gaps? those pieces are not very well understood at a, at a high level. So as chair of the committee, I would love to say, let's, you know, tackle the back lot of block of sidewalk needs in the state, but we don't even have a comprehensive map of where that is. So I'm excited that we're going to take the energy of Weep Without Driving and empower, and we're not going to send engineers to do this. We really want to get community to help survey infrastructure where they are and where they move so that we can get that on the ground feedback and excited to see that uh, effort uh, play out. And we actually are gonna start in our overburdened and marginalized communities first to make sure that the folks who really need this infrastructure because of the realities of economics and the challenges in our communities have it up front. Um, but these are some of the things that I think are born out of the culture change that comes from thinking more uh, broadly about this. And a week, with, a week Without Driving is a way of really mainstreaming this conversation, getting more people engaged. And for the folks who don't participate, you know, they're on the outside, as opposed to those of us that want this infrastructure feeling like we're on the outside. I like that framing. Yeah. And, and we have, yeah, the, the mapping work and the community mapping work is a really exciting piece of, of what we're doing here. And yeah, it wouldn't be possible, I think, without starting to shift the conversation and making sure that people think about uh, mobility beyond just dr driving mobility. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mike McGinn, who's going to help with the Q&A. Um, I think Mike and Ruth. So um, Mike, do you want to start picking some questions? You're on mute. Thanks. Thanks. Anna. There you go. Thanks. <laughs> and thanks, everybody. Great to see everybody. Some some old friends and new friends. Um, yeah, one of the um, some of the thank you for the panelists that have been jumping into the chat. But we're gonna we're gonna bring it to the panel with all for <clears throat> for all of us. Um, part of the proportion of non-drivers in the stats is kids. It took me a while to realize how legitimate it is to include kids in our view of non-driver mobility needs. So I'm hoping that perhaps Anna, who's a parent, who as well as a person who grew up unable to drive, can talk briefly about the importance of including kids in the framework. Oh my gosh, I love this question. It's almost a plant question. <laughs> it feels like uh, it, but it's a great question. It's a great question. You know, kids are a big percentage of our of of non-drivers in all our communities, right? And uh, when I talk about non-drivers sort of broadly as this group, we get a lot of pushback. Why are you counting kids? Kids, you know, kids can't travel alone. Kids, you know, shouldn't travel alone. And um, I think it's important that we talk about kids too, because kids need to go places, right? As a parent. Most of the places I go are taking my kid places. And when we ask you know, people to participate in Week Without Driving, we, most of the challenges we hear from parents are how difficult it is to get kids to after school activities and how they just had to drive to that soccer game or that dance class, because those are the places that aren't you know, particularly well set up. And you just think about what that means for families that don't have access to a car or time to drive. Or, um, or can't drive like me, um, what does that mean for, for those families? And so, yeah, I think it's important that we include kids. I think it's important that we think about, you know, and older kids too, who wanna be able to travel ind independently and can if, if we have safe crossings and if we have reliable buses, um, but without those things do become dependent on their parents. And, um, you know, disproportionately that, that transportation work falls on uh, on women usually in the household. And so thinking of the gender implications of discounting kids' mobility. So lots to unpack there. I'm sure, um, yeah, other folks probably have thoughts too, but I think it it um, it is really important to think about kids as part of the population of folks who need to go places and could benefit from less reliance on driving. Anybody else wanna jump in on the kid 
kid issue. As well, I'll jump in just as a parent. Three, I mean, my working on sidewalks in my neighborhood was was I literally couldn't walk with my kids two blocks to the grocery store without feeling threatened by cars driving really fast through the neighborhood. And boy, it's such a fear, right? Of your kids heading off to school, whether they're walking or biking. It's like I can't think of that. There's a greater fear as a parent probably than than the danger. I, you know, all of the all of the fairy tales we read as kids had wolves, and I, I think back in those times, wolves were really dangerous. Now the stories we tell our kids are all about how to not get run over by cars and how to be careful around cars, and that's really a, a terrible thing. Um, we we also like what we learn in childhood, we carry into adulthood. So I think about when I turned sixteen, like getting my driver's license was this huge milestone, and it really has shaped the way that I move. And I'm really passionate about like, if we teach our kids to think in multimodal ways, when they turn 18, their brain isn't going to delete that information, like they're going to carry those behaviors with them. So here in Washington, we've made public transit free for kids. So all of our youth can use our buses, our beautiful ferries, our trains for free. We also are paying for school-based bike education so that kids in every community, not just those whose families can afford a bike or afford to take the time to learn about bike education, that every kid will have that. And you know, I, one of my colleagues, I, a few months after we passed that said, I didn't realize that when you do that, you actually are going to really change how these young people move as they get into adulthood. And was, you know, that's sort of our, our secret plan uh, to change the future of mobility here is as more people are used to doing it, then when they move to a place where that's not available, they're not going to say, oh, I'm going to go get a car. They're going to go to their local leaders and say, why can't I do it here too uh, and build that movement from the ground up? A couple of questions in the chat, and I'll invite anyone to answer, both our elected officials and, and the advocates and agency people, about how do you how do you make sure you hear from uh, everybody? You know, both both the difficulty of getting meetings. By the way, I've stood in front of town halls with uh, hundreds of people angry at me about a bike lane, but I also can see polling that shows that the public really supports walking, biking, and transit as alternatives, and certainly non-drivers do. And so I suspect I was just getting a portion of the community demographic at those meetings. Um, what are your thoughts on how do you make sure you can hear from everybody in the process and not allow loud negative voices to dominate that discussion? Um, I'll, I'll throw it to Seth first, and then maybe uh, to Neil. Uh, Lindsay, I said Seth because I think I know a Seth Stroman Warren. Lindsay. You do. That is the only other Stroman Warren in the world, and that is my brother. And he <laughs> does work at King County Public Health and used to work on uh, walk for um, walk, walking advocacy. In, my apology, uh, I, Lindsay. I imagine. No, that's totally great. I love it. Okay. Um, I hope my brother's ears are burning. So how do we how do we engage people, Lindsay, um, who are not the the normal people who show up at a community meeting and hear from everybody as an elected official? Yeah, um, it's it's elected officials, but it's also it's the community, right? So like as a city council member, this is my free time. This is my hobby. Um, you know, we're paid a small amount. I call it AmeriCorps light because that's kind of how much it is. Um, so so to move policy, especially, and I've seen in the chat uh, people asking, or the question and answer, people asking about how do we, how do we move city councils um, or elected officials that don't want to increase access to decision making? I think it's, a, it's, it's community organizing. It's figuring out who are our allies, both inside and outside of the agency, and how do we build power to make the changes that we want to make? So I found if I'm the only one as an elected official trying to move a policy, I have to be the policymaker, I have to be the community organizer, I have to be the, the policy researcher all at the same time. And I, I know how to do that, but I don't have the time to do that in that moment to actually make the change happen. Um, and then we get kind of sidelined and, and you know, the, the status quo comes in place. And we know the status quo is, is driver-oriented development patterns and assumptions that everybody can drive, which is just categorically not true. So it, it, it's going to take not just elected officials, 
uh, but it takes community members and it takes staff as well. Find the allies in the agency who want to move in the right direction and um, you know, work together kind of inside outside strategy is a term people use, collaborative governance is a term people use, um, and then do that over time and build those relationships. I know that's a pretty generic answer, but I think we're, we're talking in multiple different localities here. Benil, from an agency perspective, what, 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 did, what would you say um, both to the advocates out there in the world and to agency people about what they sh can or should do differently? Yeah, I, I agree. It's the community. I, I think it's talking to our community partners, talking to them because they know their communities and being able to get that word out there and saying, we want these folks at the table. We want to know what their experiences are. Um, building those relationships by asking questions and listening. You have to start there. Um, I think it's it's going out there and doing it, it, it if it's virtual, if it's, you know, if it's online, phone calls, in person, whatever works for that community is what you need to do. Um, and every, everyone's going to be different, but being able to meet them where they are um, and listening, like that's the huge part of it. Being open to listen to what they have to say. It might not be something pleasant, but being able to listen to it and understanding where they're coming from, you know, it is a it is a place of fear when you're walking and cars are coming at you, um, and people want to be able to verbalize that and and for somebody to actually care enough to ask those questions. So I think the community is the 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 best place to start. The different communities and and talking to those organizations. You know, an innovation that the city of Seattle had before I became mayor was not just counting on the agency experts to seek input, but actually hiring people as contractors from the local community. So from different immigrant and refugee communities or language communities or interest communities to be the to do the outreach on behalf of the agency. So um, if anybody wants to learn more about that, who's listening, feel free to reach out to us. But it was it was really great. And you really, and it wasn't just to go out to them and ask them to come to the city, but actually to go out and hold meetings at the places where they were holding meetings and get already and get their input. Um, and and that, that they were really a great set of advisors to city government. Um, this is like, what do we do? Boy, I'm gonna throw this at, at uh, Adrian first. So get ready and then Marco. What do we do when our state DOT constantly says no to safety for anyone but drivers and weaponizes ADA and the MUTCD, the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, an engineering manual, to deny improvements? What do we do when the engineers keep saying no? Adrian, what have you found makes a difference? Um, well, I can't speak to that particular situation necessarily, but we do, um, the Denver Streets Partnership is a coalition-based organization, so one of our key advisory um, organizations is the uh, Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, and so they are heavily involved in the advocacy work that we do, and because of that, you know, when something is cited as um, as not worthy of of you know making improvements because of how it might impact the dis disabled community uh, we we have that advocate in our corner to be able to say actually i am living this experience we are here as part of this organization and that's just not right and so um you can kind of i guess put it back on the lived experience of those folks that once you've done that community organizing and are able to bring those people in to share that experience and that's that's what we found has been one of the best ways, but um, <clears throat> not being the policy director here, I, I can't speak to too much more on our strategy. Marco, what, what you must have heard this from some of your constituents. Boy, I've asked for this, but the agency people tell me that's not possible. What, what, where, where do you go then? Yeah, I mean, we are flipping the script here in Washington, and we have placed a requirement on our state DOT that any project worth more than $500,000 has to uh, use a complete streets or a safe systems approach. So, you know, we did that 
a year, two years ago. So it's going to take a little bit of time for that to percolate. But I do think that policymakers are critical in changing the narrative. And we know the safe systems approach is the way that we're going to get uh, to a vision of zero traffic fatalities. And that means re-envisioning our infrastructure. We also have great engineers within the transportation system that have written guidelines. So if they talk to you about the MUTCD or uh, ADA, then talk to them about the complete streets guidelines that come from NHTSA or come from your uh, your state DOT or from uh, the AASHTO uh, manuals. So there are absolutely manuals that support it. Um, and there are absolutely guidelines that support it, but it's also about policymakers flipping the script. And the first thing the DOT said was, we're going to need more resource if you want us to do this. And, you know, that's fine. We need to have that conversation about how do we build a system that works for everybody, not just for one uh, narrow set of users. And, and for the advocates, I can report that elected officials face the same thing. And, uh, you know, getting the knowledge to, to stand toe to toe with your trans, your, your, your traffic engineer, you know, whoever the chief traffic engineer is important. I have to say, when you get the right one, like I did in Seattle, by the way, working at the state now, Don Ho Cheng, makes a huge difference. Yeah. Makes a huge difference. Somebody who's actually we were, we were proud to steal him. Yeah, well, he's awesome. Um, Anna, you are an advocate. What did what do you find your techniques that work? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to sort of build off what Senator Elias was sharing around the complete streets work. And I think that really has been or will be a game changer here in Washington State. We're just starting to see how that gets implemented. But I spent uh, the summer working with our state DOT to go out and um, bring community members along with teams of engineers on a bunch of state uh, walk roll audits in different parts of the state for the engineers to experience how the infrastructure was and wasn't working for people walking and rolling and biking. And in the context of the complete streets uh, mandate now, how they could improve that in the future. And I think, you know, having those experiences of using the infrastructure, like we ask people to do during week without driving, and also having the experience of using it in partnership and in parallel with someone with a mobility disability or a vision disability, so they could really see what it's like to cross that highway moving, you know, um, at one or two feet per second, um, what what does that feel like? And and it really, I think, um, made them understand the importance of the complete streets work. And I think many of the engineers who I anticipated would be less welcome to this new mandate were really excited about rethinking how they could build roads to to work better for everyone. So I think it you know, but it comes from valuing the experience of the people who are using that infrastructure day in and day out. Uh, and also getting out of uh, out of the vehicle and trying to use it walking or rolling, which you wouldn't always do um, as a traffic engineer. So um, just a, a shout out for for that that uh, valuing the expertise of the people using it, I think is is really key in what week without driving gets at. I will throw out a tip for advocates and elected officials who run into that. Ask to see and have explained to you where it says that. Um, sometimes um, it's it's actually back in the brain and, and the standards or rules have changed. And, you know, we can't spend money on that. Well, show me, show me the language on that is useful. And when you do get the language on that, if they come up with it, uh, there are allies out there. Um, I'm a big fan of NACDO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials. And I'm sure that somebody, I hope I'm not giving them too many phone calls, Sure, somebody out there would be welcome to help at America Walks. We we wouldn't we could take a look too and see what we can know. Um, but but oftentimes the opposition is built more on muscle memory than actual statute or rules that are in place at the time or standards that are in place at the time. So we're coming up on the hour. I feel like I should just do for anybody who wants to leave after an hour. Let me just do the closing slides. But everybody hang in. Anybody hang in. Anybody who has to jump at the hour that's on the panel, do so. Anyone that wants to stick around, I got a couple more questions after the closing slides. So Ruth, can you throw them up? There we go. Oh, okay. This one matters, people. Um, Week Without Driving, we don't have any big foundation grants supporting this. This is happening because we're pulling this out of our reserves and our reserves have been built from individual donations. So if you love what we do, if you love the Week Without Driving, send us a little bit of support. We love that. Next slide. Um, the, uh, the, oh, 
next webinar, Inclusive Transportation, a Manifesto for Repairing Divided Communities. I'm with one of our former board members, Veronica Davis, who now is heading Houston. We're really looking forward to this one. So uh, look on the look on the website and you can find it. Um, and is that it, Ruth? Do we have any more slides after that? That's it. That is it. Okay, well, let's just jump back in for a couple more questions with, with who's still with us. We lost Mar uh, Marco, and but, but really added quite a bit and that was great. Um, one of the questions we heard was, um, we were interested in hearing more about the community mapping work you touched on briefly, and have any of you been using OpenStreetMap to look at walking, biking, rolling infrastructure? So I'll, I'll toss that to um, Lindsay or Anna if they want to take a shot at that. I can take a. I can talk a little bit more about the the mapping work. It's still. Uh, it was. It was passed in the last session um, of the legislature, and we're still um, getting it spun up. The work is being led by the Tascar Center at the University of Washington. They're a center that focuses on accessible technology and has done mapping projects like this in um, parts of the U.S. and also parts of Latin America. And so we'll be building on that model in partnership with Front and Centered, which is a coalition of uh, environmental justice, BIPOC-led groups. Uh, so still figuring out how that's all going to work and what it's going to look like. But um, as we get that worked out, I'm sure we would be excited to share best practices. And I am not an open streets map person, not a total data person, but I know it exists. Um, if anyone else wants to jump in on that one. Yeah, yeah I'd have to defer to, to our uh, staff on the open street map stuff. I hope it's being used, but I don't know um, for sure. Um, I, I noticed in the Q&A, there's, there's questions about the challenge of getting agencies, cities, uh, transit agencies, uh, the state to change what we're doing. And it, it is it took us a hundred years to build this system that is entirely focused on on cars. And we're not going to fix it overnight, even when we have the political will to fix it. So I think there's a, initially kind of a cultural change and a political will change that we have to make. And then it's actually like getting it on the ground and intervening in, in every decision that's happening of like, is this in the best interest of all street users and not just drivers? And it's embedded everywhere in a city's code, in a city's policies, in just the practices of city staff. Same thing at transit agencies, same thing at the state the transportation agencies. So like it can get really frustrating and feel like we want to just scream at these systems of like, why don't you make this safe now? And and part of it is it takes a long time, even when we want to make it safer for everybody, it takes a long time to actually change the physical infrastructure because it took a long time to build it. So I, I'm not trying to to tone down the like outrage that I, I hear in the Q&A, uh, mm -hmm. but because that that is important and that it motivates us, but also understanding this is a long game fight for us to make places where everybody is safe to travel around the way that they should be able to. Um, the, 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 the issue of like advocating within the, the planners, I guess the engineers, especially it's the engineers, they love to make this about liability and we can't, you know, do it the other way that people want to, because we have this liability thing and it's all so convoluted. And it was an eight hour webinar that they did. And, you know, you're not going to understand it. So don't even try. Um, and so just being really persistent with that and continuing to push is really key. Um, and yeah, I forget the other thing I want to say, but I'll leave it there. Thanks. No, I, you know, there's a pretty good close in there about the about the persistence that's required for culture change, and that really is, and that culture change is is part of the of the of the of the goal as well as the policy change as well as the infrastructure change. Like it it it, it takes all of it. I will give Anna a close because uh, that was sure. uh, Lindsay. That was a close. And I'll let uh, I'll let Anna take a close, and then we'll uh, call it good. And thank everyone for coming. Obviously, Anna, last word. Yeah, I think you know on this question of you know, of course, you want things changed now, right? And and yet it is decades of of work that's made the system not work particularly well for not driving that were we built in car dependency, and so. I think a lot of the work I do now is focused on how do we get people in place so that we can create this change over the next generation, right? And so 
I'm really excited about the younger folks, the Gen Z folks who are choosing not to have cars, um, often for climate reasons, uh, also for cost, right? I think that that's exciting. I think getting more non-drivers into positions of power, into transportation agencies, um, into on transit boards. I've been talking to Lindsay about how to do that. I think these things are really, really important because um, when you start to have people in the room who say the system is not working for me, that shifts the dynamic. Um, people can't continue to pretend that it's working and, and the status quo and business as usual is, is going to continue. And so just to encourage you to think about how do you get the voices of those most impacted of non-drivers into rooms where they're not normally. Um, and whatever that takes, I think that's that's the direction that I'm I'm hopeful for and, and that I hope Wheat Without Driving inspires you to uh, to pursue. And thanks, Mike, for, for hosting this and for all your support to bring this challenge to a larger audience. I think it uh, is, is starting to really uh, shift the conversation in a profound way. And the week, this National Week with Drive, Without Driving has been amazing, the amount of interest nationwide. And I just want to say, you know, getting involved, you get to work with people like Anna and Lindsay and the other people you saw. And so, yeah, it's long, hard work, but you get to work with great people. So come on in. There's uh, great advocates around the country to join in with. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And special thank you to all our panelists.